So we are concluding this series this morning on the fruits of the Spirit. And before we jump into that, we, so next Sunday we'll be starting a new message series. And uh, this is the series, the study that we're going to take all through the summer. Okay, so um, if you haven't noticed, right, the weather is actually getting nicer. Okay, schools are, are getting done. Right? We're moving into summer schedule. And so through the summer, we are going to study the book of Hebrews. So we are going to be going through the through whole book of Hebrews. We are going to go through all of the entire book over the summer. Okay? And so, again, through the summer, um, you're going to hear from me. You're also going to hear from Pastor Ben and Pastor Brian. Um, the three of us are splitting up this series. And so uh, we will are each taking a few different weeks. Um, and if you don't know, I'm, actually, I'm going on sabbatical this summer. And so Brian and Ben are covering for me in those weeks that I'm gone. Uh, and so... Um, there, are, there are 13 chapters in Hebrews. I'm teaching five of them. Brian is teaching five of them, and Ben's teaching, or sorry, he's doing four, he, Ben's doing four, and I'm doing five. Okay, and so that's where we're getting to the 13 chapters. Um, so next week, we will kick that series off um, with uh, Hebrews chapter one. And, and so again, we'll start that. But through the summer, like I said, as as we go through the book, so you know what we're doing, right? You know what we're studying, and as you go on trips or camping or out of town or here with us or you know, wherever you're at, you know where we're going. So I encourage you just to read ahead, right? Study on your own. Stay, stay up with whatever we're doing this summer because just one of our goals, and we talked about this, this in our staff meeting this last week, one of our goals here at Faith Journey is that we are not taking the summer off. And yes, we are going to enjoy extra time with our family and trips and what, you know, outside stuff, and, but we're not taking the summer off of our faith, right? We're going to continue to move forward, right? And we're, we're going to continue to be here when we're in town. We're going to continue to study and learn and, and grow. And we have a couple of small groups that are continuing to meet through the summer. Um, you know, we have uh, like a journey class coming up. We're going to be looking at those. We're not taking the summer off from our faith. And sometimes that's the temptation, isn't it? Like, man, I'm just gone. We're out of touch. We're doing these things. Um, but we're not, we're gonna, not going to do that this summer, right? We're going to continue to grow, right? Continue to learn. And so we're going to spend the summer in the book of Hebrews. So today, as we conclude the fruits of the Spirit, okay, we are um, wrapping it up with these last two attributes, gentleness and self-control. Um, but, but before we jump into that, I just we're going to start just what we've done every week. We're going to read our, our base text for this series, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 26. So if you're here with us in person and you have your own Bible, please uh, grab it um, and open up to Galatians 5. If, you're here, if you don't have your own Bible, there are Bibles provided for you in the seats you're welcome to use. You can grab one of those and see the page number is included there where you can find this passage in those Bibles. If you're with us online, great to have you with us as well. Grab your Bible and follow along, or just, just listen as I read it. But at this point, this should be a pretty familiar passage. We've read it every week. Uh, so Galatians 5, starting at verse 16, where it says, And so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So again, as we read this now familiar text, I hope it's familiar to you, right? as we read this, this passage, we see how it's literally comparing these two ways to do life. Right? We can either do life according to our sinful nature or we can do life according to the Spirit of God. And it, and it 
obviously puts those two things at odds, right? It says that, that they, it, it's, it is one or the other, right? And our goal as followers of Jesus is to live life by the Spirit. No longer by our sinful nature like we used to do, right? But now by being led by the Spirit of God. And, and again, just he points out, right, the, the, the different fruits that come, right, the good and the bad. If you're living according to your sinful nature, this is what your life will produce, right? And he gives us the, the bad list, right, in verses 19 through 21. But notice that that list is all action-based. But then the good fruits, right, the, the fruits of the Spirit that are listed in verses 22 through 23 are all character traits. Right? They're more about your heart, right? about what makes you, you, from the, on the inside. Right? And obviously those will affect your actions, but what is described are these, these characteristics of God himself. And we've seen that as we've studied these, right? that, that it starts with who God is, right? and the characteristics of that. And then as we become more and more like God, as we are transformed by his spirit, as we move forward in our faith journey, those same attributes start to become a part of who we are. In fact, if we think about that, that truly is the goal of our faith. The goal of our faith is to be made holy like he is holy. Now, there's a lot of benefits that come with that. <laughs> right? Salvation being one of them, right? As we have this, uh, this um, you know, healed relationship with God that has been broken by sin. And as we continue that transformation journey, we become closer and closer to God and, and to be like him, to be more like Christ tomorrow than I am today as I continue on this faith journey. And our theme verse for this series is in Galatians 5.25. It says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Again, the premise of this is that you are living by the Spirit. And the way you start that, the only way you do that is by receiving Christ as your Savior. Right? That's where your journey starts, is accepting him as your Savior, receiving his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness as you confess your sins and receive the Holy Spirit as a follower of Jesus. As you start that relationship, because your sin is paid for, right now you have this relationship with God that now starts to grow. A process that we call the spiritual faith journey. And we've gone through, again, from week to week, through these different attributes that are described in verses 22 through 23, Pastor Brian stopped, started off with you in the first week as he talked about the different kinds of love. And then we looked at joy and peace and how they are connected. And then we looked at the really fun study of patience, right, where we learned that we will suffer. And then kindness and goodness and how those are connected. And last week we looked at faith. And now today, we are wrapping up this series with the last two. And these last two are also connected. And we've seen, the reality is all of them are connected, aren't they? They're all intertwined. Right? It was one strengthens, the other one starts to strengthen as well. And the last two we're looking at is gentleness and self-control. So we're going to jump right in. The first one is the fruit of gentleness. And as we look at this one, again, the, um, again, the Greek word that is used here to describe gentleness uh, is the word Preotes. Okay, and the definition of this is meekness, gentleness, or humble. Again, just like this, just like all of them we looked at, there's, there's different connotations that come with this, this word. And, and again, the Greek language is a lot more complicated than English in a lot of ways. And there's these different connotations. And again, it, it's pluses and minuses. But as we, as we look at that, we see this definition is actually one of the more simple ones, right? This word that's used here in the fruits of the Spirit is the same uh, word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, if we look at the, the, um, the Beatitudes, right, which is the intro into Jesus' most famous sermon in Matthew chapter 5, in 5.5 5, he says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Okay, this is the same word, the same Greek word that Jesus uses there in this verse is what is used in Galatians 5. That is translated... Again, as gentleness, right, in, in the NLT version in Galatians, but you notice here, right, it's translated as humble, right? God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. 
Like, Jesus breaks this down in the sermon and looks at these other ways, but, but basically Jesus is telling us, teaching us this concept, right? The, the way to find real life is not through self-gratification. Right? It's not through our own egos. Right? It is through humbleness. Right? Even denying yourself, right? That's where you find real life. But that's where you find the truth, the truth that Jesus says will set you free. Right, this is a road that not all of us always want to take, is it? Right, and yet, Jesus teaches us over and over, and we see here again, that, that humbleness, gentleness, meekness is, is something that, that, that we need right, to, to find true contentment in life. To know that life's not about me. In fact, life about the Spirit is, I mean, it's about God. But as we look at that, there's a couple, you know, aspects of gentleness, of humbleness that we can look at, that we see throughout Scripture. The um, first one I want to point out is that gentleness is being confident, but not arrogant. You know, arrogance is something that is very prevalent in our culture, isn't it? Right, we see it all the time. If, if you haven't seen it for a while, just watch the after-game interviews of professional athletes. Right, and you can see it. But we don't have to go very far to see it, do we? Right, but we see arrogance all the time. Right, because, again, if we're, for those that are living according to sinful nature, the way of the world, it says, I mean, that's what the world tells us, right? Life is about me. You look out for number one. Right? And I am better than everyone else. Right? We build up ourselves. And we see arrogance in lots of places. Now, again, gentleness and humbleness is something I think is, it is misconstrued in, in a lot, for a lot of us, right? even in our culture. It, it, it's seen as weakness. See, but it, it, it's not at all. In fact, that's why I'm saying that gentleness, it is confidence, knowing what I know, right? Knowing how life works, knowing that God is in control, knowing that, that I serve him, right? I can know, I have confidence in all of those things. It doesn't mean that I get walked over or pushed over. That I am confident in what I know is true, right? And what my life is about, right? And, and, and my, even my own abilities, right? I can be confident in those without being arrogant, Right? And that's an aspect of gentleness. But the reality is sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. But sometimes we have interactions with people and when you kind of leave out and be like, well, was that arrogance or was that confidence? I'm not really sure. And you know, where the way you find out is actually in, in you know, see how it plays out, right? Because you might leave in a moment and not be able to tell, but you will be able to tell the more you interact with that person. Right? Is it arrogance or is it confidence? In fact, we see, um, as we look at, at Paul's writings, I mean, which Paul wrote Galatians, but we, we see uh, and Paul had a very close relationship with a protege named Timothy. Okay, and in fact, he, um, he raised him up in the faith and, and passed a baton of leadership onto him. And, and we see just in, in one of his letters to Timothy, Paul wrote, these words, as he was talking about, again, just leadership and the world and ch the church and all these things, and, and he tells Timothy, he says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Now notice he He's telling Timothy, stand up for the right things. Right? But do it with gentleness, not arrogance. And right? he's telling him to fight the good fight for the faith. Right? And that's the difference, right, between fights usually. Right? Is if the wrong fight is usually about myself. Right? But the right fight is about God about his truth and he says but again he's like timothy you are a man of god so stand up fight the right fight for the true faith right run from evil things 
right? And there's gentleness and humbleness, meekness. That's a part of that advice. Okay, the other place we see um, this kind of described is, again, Peter, the Apostle Peter. He wrote, again, in, in his letters. Uh, again, he had similar context as he's kind of comparing the world and the way of following Jesus. And in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, he says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. So again, notice the same premise, right? That your life's about God. It's not about you anymore. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Again, the way that we come across to those, especially even those that ask about our faith, about the hope that we have, about, hey, how is your life different? How did you get through that struggle? You know, uh, um, how, how, did, how do you gain that perspective, right? And, and again, the whole premise is they're going to ask because your life's different. Right? They're going to notice there's something different about you. And when they ask, he says, tell them, explain the reason you for your hope, right? The reason is God, but but do it in a gentle and respectful way. Which leads kind of to the next point, as we see, as he's proving this, that gentleness um, is, in a lot of ways, just being considerate. Right? About being careful in the ways that, that we interact with those, especially those that disagree with us. We see in Ephesians uh, 4, verse 2, where we are told, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Again, this one you know, connects all the way back to the top of the list, right? To love. In fact, we, we see so many times that, it, it, again, they're all interconnected, right? They're all, they're all intertwined. But, and yet we see to always be humble and gentle, right? Be patient with others, making allowance for their faults. Right, because of your love. In fact, Jesus took this whole idea to a whole other level, right? When he actually said that, the, that my followers will be identified in this world by how they love each other. Right, that will be the for number one marker, right? Between God's people and people of the world will be their love for each other. And again, how you come across to somebody when you share the hope of Jesus that you have really matters. And again, the reality, church, is that we have not done a good job of this. And we've already kind of talked about this in, earlier in the series and kind of those things, but, but again, the, the, the church's reputation, especially even just Christians' reputation, especially in America, is not about how well we love each other. In fact, I'll tell you, even as a pastor, that's one of the things I constantly see, right? I'm, I mean, I have all, you know, I've, things come through my email all the time about I'm on all kinds of different pastors' lists and blog things and stuff, and, and there's so much about that comes around right, to pastors and church leaders about how do you deal with people criticizing you, right, and being mean to you and, call, you know, all these kind of things, right? Unfortunately, that's, that's the wrong reputation, in fact, a lot of the unbelieving world looks at the church and realizes that we're good at shooting our wounded. And that's a, does that break anybody else's heart? Because it sure does mine. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of that reputation. And, and as we see this, as, as, as this advice, right, this, this, um, again, this fruit of the Spirit, right, of of humbleness, of gentleness, right, of meekness is, is how it comes across. It really matters. Again, how we present the hope of Jesus to others really matters. I'll tell you, I have never come across somebody that told me that they came to know Jesus because they lost the debate. Yeah, I've, I've, now, if, if you know somebody, I would love to hear their story, but I've never heard anybody that told me that. Right, think about how do people come to know Jesus, right? They come because somebody cared about them, right? Because somebody loved them right? when they felt like that they were unlovable. I mean, that's what God does for us, right? And that's how we should be passing that on. Hey, ultimately, the big picture definition of, of gentleness is gentleness is being submissive to the will of God. 
right, is saying, I will step aside and let God rule my perspectives and my decisions and my actions and my interaction, my relationships and, and everything, right? It's, it's being submissive to the will of God. It's surrendering my way to God's way. Putting him at the top of the priority list, no matter what. They think as we see, how do we do this? And I think there's, there's a couple verses I want to share with you of, of ways that I think Paul comes out. Again, Paul who wrote Galatians. In fact, we see at the beginning of Galatians, there's one of these verses that, that truly has become a life verse for me personally. But this is, both these verses are verses that, that I've heard people use against Paul because they come back and, again, there's an opinion about Paul in his writing that he was a very arrogant person. And in fact, if you look for that, you can kind of find some of those tones in his writings. But again, we go back to that question. Was he arrogant or was he confident in what he knew? And with that said, is again, Galatians 1.10, where he says, Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And again, this is a verse that kind of could, again, come across in an arrogant way. Right, and, and again, if it's used, it could be used in an arrogant way. But again, what I see in these words, right, is Paul saying, he's like, you know what? God's first, no matter what. I, I'm, I, my life is about pleasing him. And, and, and that is a hill that he is going to die on. Right? Even if it makes other people upset, I, I'm not going to choose people over God. I'm just not going to do it. Right? And, and again, this comes, I mean, believe, it, again, it could come across as arrogant, but I believe it's coming across as confident of what he knows and the commitment of his life. Right? That he is saying, no, I am submitting to the will of God in my life no matter what. Even if your opinion is different on what I should do. Right, and another one in, is in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. I think leading up to this, right, you set the context in 1 Corinthians 7, it's the kind of last part of chapter 7, where he says, I don't just do what is best for me, I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. And so you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And again, he's standing up as a leader and saying, hey, you, I'm leading the way. Right? And, and part, of where I, part of the way I'm leading the way is saying, I will do anything so that people can know who Jesus is. Right? And he says, and you should imitate me. I do the same things I'm doing because I'm just, all I'm doing is imitating Christ. Right? I've submitted my life to him. I'm doing what he told me to do, and so now you can follow my lead in that. Again, gentleness really comes down to, are we submitting ourselves to God or are we not? Right, just as you see in Galatians 5, right, these are at odds with each other. Either life is about me or life is about God. And the reality is, there's not a lot of gray area. And then we, we see this last one as we move off from gentleness. The last one is the fruit of self-control. Hey, now this one, again, is very connected, right? And, and we talked about this. That, again, we start with even gentleness, even just submitting ourselves to Christ for the first time and, and opening our, receiving him as our Savior. That's us submitting to his will, right? To saying, like, no, I will stop trying to earn my way to heaven and earn my own salvation. I will let you, I will receive the gift that you're freely giving me through grace. Right, and that's us, again, submitting our will to him. And, and, and in that, a part of that is this level of self-control. Right? And again, the, the Greek word, I'm not even going to try and say it. Okay, so you could copy it down. Okay, I'm not even going to try and say it because I'm going to butcher it. Okay, but this is the Greek word that here is used in Galatians 5 that's translated as self-control. It is self-mastery, self-restraint, self-control, or temperance. Okay, and this is, again, me having... Again, enough restraint in my own ego, enough restraint in my own desires, enough you know, restraint even in, in, in even what I hope for and, and what, what I commit to, right? To say that, that it's not about me, that it's going to be about God. 
In fact, we, we see again, Jesus speaks directly to this. This is a very common concept that we read, and I think that in so many times we kind of miss the, the depth of what Jesus means in Matthew 6, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Now this, again, in reading, it feels like a paradox, doesn't it? Right? How do I live if I die to myself? Right, but Jesus is, he's literally talking about these, I mean, the whole thing together, right? He's like, the only way to find real life is to die to yourself, to give it up, right? To, to lay your life down, again, at the foot of the cross, right? to die to myself, right, and my selfishness. And then... He says, then I will lift you up. I, I will lift you up for my sake. And your salvation comes with that, by the way. <laughs> right? Can I set myself aside and now make my purpose in life about God instead of about me? That's, we see that's, that's the whole passage, doesn't it? It sums up the whole passage of Galatians 5 that we've been reading over these last weeks. Life's either about me or it's about God. There's not a lot of gray area. Right, as we see, again, self-control, what it really means, and what this is describing, right, is that self-control really means that I am being spirit-controlled. Right, that I will do what God tells me to do. <laughs> But, and even once I hear God's voice, and I know that, at that point, it's not even a matter of faith. At that point, it's a matter of obedience. Again, will I follow through with what God has told me to do? Right? Will I set my own desires aside, and will, be, will I follow the Spirit's leading in my life? Right? That's exactly what we read at the beginning of this passage. Right? That's what this entire thing is about. Is, is my life controlled by the Holy Spirit, or do I can still control it myself? Right, Galatians 5, verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation of the world. And I'll just summarize the law of Moses by this, right? Is my life truly about God? I need to bring him glory, or is it about myself? There's really not a lot of gray area. As we think about this challenge, right, this, this concept, we, we see again a very famous verse. We see John the Baptist, right, as he's quoted so much in John 3.30, this is, this is the core of what he meant, right? When he said, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Again, he being God. Right? Jesus in my life, he, he takes more and more of who I am, right, as I'm transformed by his spirit. And by default, that means that I become less and less. Right, as I move down my spiritual journey, as I become more and more like Christ every day, right, the reality is, is that this, my selfishness and starts being molded out as more of God's presence is molded in. Right, and we continue on this journey right, every day to be spirit-controlled, not self-controlled. And, and as, we, as we look at this, again, this last one in in the list, right, in Galatians 5. It, again, it, and it creates it all the way back around, right, because, again, it's not love of myself. It connects back to, to love for God instead of love for myself, right, to the first one. But, but as you look at this, again, they're all interconnected. However, self-control is the key to all the fruits of the Spirit. 
Again, can I keep my own heart, my own desires, my own ego in check? Right, and let God rule. And let God transform me. And let God speak into my life. Now, I was, I was really toying with this fill-in. What I really wanted to put, but I thought it might just be too dad jokey. What I really wanted to put was self-control is the key ingredient to the entire fruit salad. See, by your reaction, I made the right choice. <laughs> self-control is the key to all the fruits of the Spirit. I'll have to tell Pastor Brian he was right. I ran it past him. He's like, yeah, don't do that. He was right. Second Peter 1, 5 through 7 says... In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly love, and brotherly love with love for everyone. Again, this is Peter's writing, not Paul's, right? We've been studying his, but notice this feels like a pretty familiar list, doesn't it? Right, as we see all these different, the one thing I like about Peter's list, right, is look what's right in the middle. Self-control. Right, and again, they're all interconnected, right? They all feed the others. But yet, the battle we all face every day, every morning, every night, every decision, every relationship, is it going to be about me? Or is it going to be about God? All right, will I die to myself and let him rule? Will I deny myself so I can lift up his cross? All right, if, if life was about me, I would not be Christ's servant. Because there's really not a lot of grace. I think when we think about this idea, think about this concept, think about all of these together, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. It's all part of who God is and who God wants us to be as we are transformed to be more like him every day. And as we think about this idea, this concept, this challenge, this, this all that's encompassed into this, right, my question to you is, what's holding you back in your faith journey? Again, I don't know where you're at in your faith journey. I don't know, maybe you've never received Christ as your Savior. Maybe that's your next step, right, that you need to take. You need to just surrender your heart and your will to him and receive him in your life. And start this transformation journey. Right, maybe, maybe you've been walking with him for a while, but you realize even as we look at this, and you're like, man, I haven't gone very far. <laughs> right, I still have a lot of that first list in my life, and, and I need to surrender right, myself to God's spirit and remo to remove those barriers. Right, maybe you've been walking with God for a long time, but there's that thing that's sitting in the back of your head like, man, okay, I know my next step. I know I should be baptized, or I know I should, should get into a small group, or I've been wanting to take those journey classes for a long time, but I've just never done it. Right, or or I've, I've been, maybe you've been praying for those people on your 360 card, right, and you're like, I know I need to just send them a text or send them a call and have that conversation, but I just, I just haven't. Right, and just let things get in the way. Again, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where you're at in your faith journey, but I do know that God wants you to take a step forward. That maybe as we've gone through this series, you realize, like, you know what? I didn't even know it, but I am camping in my faith. I'm not journeying at all. Well, remove what's keeping you from moving forward. And, and again, as we, no matter where you're at in your faith journey, the, the next step is the same for in a in in the concept of what you have to do. Okay, and that, again, that brings me to my series final thought. Right? It's one that we've read over and over and over again throughout this time. Galatians 5, 24, and 25. 
It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Again, maybe it's just the first time you're going to nail some stuff onto, onto Jesus' cross, right? And just receive him as your Savior and do that. Right? Maybe there's something in your life that, that's holding you back and you realize, like, man, right, there's something holding me back. And so today, as we conclude our service, I want to give you a chance to do just symbolically, right, what this tells us to do, what you're going to do in your heart. And that is whatever's holding you back, whatever your next step is, that, that you haven't, that whatever it is that God's putting on your heart to, to do, to move forward, you have a chance. You can write it on one of these cars and you can put it on his cross today. Lord God, we are so thankful, God, that nothing can separate us from your love. God, you made a way. Lord, you sent Jesus to live, to sin this life, to die on the cross, and rise again on that third day so we can be saved. Lord, so you can remove all the things of our sinful nature out of our lives. God, thank you for paying the price. Lord, thank you, God, for loving us wherever we are. God, thank you for loving us enough to not leave us there. God, to transform us every day God, by the power of your spirit. And Lord, I pray that that transformation process would continue in our lives every day, every moment. God, that we can surrender to you. God, that we can live for you. Lord, that we, we can be transformed by your spirit and changing the way we think. Lord, as you change our character, where it, it does affect our actions. Lord, as we go this week, I pray, Lord, that you would not just move us forward in our own faith, God, but help us to bring others closer to you. Lord, we pray specifically for those that don't know you. God, we pray that they would find you through us. God, we would take every opportunity to show them who you are. And God, as we live out our faith, Lord, we shine your light in this dark world. And God, continue to build your kingdom. Lord, we praise you for your spirit. Lord, we thank you that we can find true life by being surrendered and controlled by that spirit every day. Lord, thank you that you give us a reason and a purpose for life. Guide us as we go this week and as we live our faith, as we move forward closer to you every day, as we continue the faith journey. We love you, we praise you. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.